Um, as a plastic surgeon, I work very closely with Chris Denton, who's in the audience, um, who's really been sending me patients for a, a long time. And I deal with really all of those elements on the list. But today I'm going to just touch on Raynaud's phenomena, systemic sclerosis, especially around the face. And I won't touch on the other parts of what I do. Treatment of Raynaud's phenomenon, um, we all know what it is, about a vasospastic uh, condition. Uh, but in 2008, I used to treat uh, people with hyperhidrosis, which is sweating of both palms and axillae with Botox, and somebody reported in the literature um, that when treating somebody with hyperhidrosis of the hand, they noticed, or well, the patient reported that they also had Raynaud's, and that was actually resolved by the Botox treatment. And you know Botox is well used, or well known about in cosmetic use. They're supposed, it supposedly acts via the sympathetic nervous system, but the mechanism of how it works in Raynaud's phenomenon is really unknown. Um, this is a, an ex experimental example of a treatment of um, a, a blood vessel uh, on the left-hand side, uh, as you look at it, that's a, a standard vessel treated with normal saline, and on the right-hand side is actually when it's treated with a Botox, a dilute Botox solution. And this actually has been shown to last at least a month. So it actually acts potentially through the smooth muscle uh, within the, the vessels. Um, I had, as I said, been doing it since 2008, but not very much, so we decided to do a trial, and we published it in 2013, when this was our first sort of trial at looking at it uh, in the treatment of Raynaud's disease, and this is the result. So we took 20 patients. Uh, the patients are very, my scleroderma patients are very brave. They're willing to try anything, and when I started doing this, I said, I don't know if it'll work. Well, they'd say, go ahead. So we did a preoperative assessment, eight and 12 weeks. We looked at pain, appearance, cold intolerance, pinch, power grip, range of motion, and a DASH score, which is something we use for hand rehabilitation. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get this to work. The injection sites at the time were through the Palmer site, so we injected towards the neurovascular bundle, which runs, let's see if I can get this to work, it runs on the side of the, each of the vessels, or of the fingers. Uh, the results showed 80% had a reduction in Raynaud's attacks, 80% reduction in pain, 65% improvement in cold intolerance, 65 in power grip, 90% improvement in pinch grip. We did have, however, a small percentage of lumbrical uh, malfunction. And lumbricals are small muscles in the hand which are important in regards to grip. This doesn't last very long, but up to about six weeks, but it was something that sort of concerned me. But it was in a very small percentage of, of patients. So I started thinking, well, actually, could we do this in a slightly different way to get rid of the lumbrical muscle problem, but still maintain the benefits. So instead of doing the Palmer approach, I decided to look at the dorsal approach. The advantage, obviously, is the dorsal approach, first of all, thinner skin, easier to do. Thicker skin on the palm, it's not pleasant to do. Mostly these patients came to me for facial work, and so when they were asleep under anesthetic, I did the Botox. So from a Palmer point of view, it didn't make any difference. But I also wanted to try and develop an outpatient treatment so you could come and get it done. And the procedure itself takes about five to ten minutes, not very long. So using, sorry, get this to work, yeah. So the interesting thing, there are some other authors that uh, report that they can't get this work, uh, um, approach to work, but actually what they may not know is, is actually hand anatomy. And as plastic surgeons, we move pieces of tissue around the hand so we know where the vessels are. But what you have to aim for is between this vessel and this vessel, but also piercing this ligament, which is the Clelundin uh, ligament, which is uh, ligaments that surround the neurovascular bundle. So if you only inject up here, it may not transverse, so you have to get between both. Um, this is just a close-up of the Cleland ligament, as you can see that ligament there. It also spreads up and down the hand, so you can see it's, it's quite a fibrous tissue. Sorry. I'll get this to work eventually. Nope. Okay. So we then looked at this again in a study, which we're trying to publish at the moment. We're finding it difficult to publish it. Again, using a dorsal approach. Again, through the dorsum of the hand. Um, and what we found was we did this as an outpatient treatment using a cryo spray on the, on the, in the web space to basically numb the area like you do for most Botox. We found the onset using thermographic camera was between 10 minutes to up to three weeks after treatment. 
it lasts anywhere, if it, if it works on you, it lasts between three and nine months. So it's pretty um, amazing sort of time uh, um, uh, effect. And works in patients that are on Iloprost as well, so, and all the amnifedipine. So it obviously works in a slightly different mechanism to the, these other interventions. And some patients we treat uh, when they're on Iloprost infusion uh, at the same time. Okay, I'm gonna have fun here, sorry. So what we found in that study, improve, improvement in the majority of patients, 86% uh, reduced in pain and swelling, 73% in cold intolerance, significant improvement in hand function, 85% decreased in Raynaud's attacks, but more importantly, we found no muscle weakness in this approach. So this is actually a slightly safer approach, but also the results were slightly better. And usually in Raynaud's, it's not sometimes very easy to see the color changes. And so what we use is a thermographic camera. And this is a series of injections. So this is the web area that I'm going to inject. And so if you watch that area, you'll see it change through this series of injections. You can see it's beginning to come little red flashes there. Going on, going on, going on. And that's it. So from that point of view, it's really interesting. You go back to, sorry, I'm not having fun here is that it actually also, apart from going that way, it also goes that way. So it goes up and down the hand. And this is an example before treatment, after treatment, before treatment, after treatment. Sorry. It also works on feet. So I've written up a series of feet. I'll try and get you to so post up on feet. And quite a number of patients are more bothered by their feet than their hands. We also can treat noses. I've had a small series of patients who have Raynaud's of the nose as well. Coming to facial scleroderma, um, I'll just talk about the facial changes in, in, in systemic sclerosis. So this is a sort of standard look of orofacial changes, pan facial changes, skin sclerosis, lipodystrophy, so you get loss of soft tissue volume, uh, lip and lid retraction, so the lid is dropped down, this is the lip is pulled down, nasal pinching, so we get lots of loss of the alar, which is the side unit of the face, soft tissue loss, as well as the dorsum, as well as the loss of cheek, um, and this is sort of a, cl a classical look that I see all the time. And it is always amazing to me when people, patients bring in pictures of how they were before the condition and how they are now, and they're really a different person. And obviously what I have tried to do over the last 10 to 15 years is trying to restore them back towards normality. So what I usually get presented with a problem is microstomia, so they have a tightening of the mouth, and um, we've been reconstructing facial tissue with a whole range of um, adjuncts. Most plastic surgeons historically wouldn't want to treat anybody with scleroderma because they're on immunosuppression. Historically, they have poor wound healing. Um, I have had a journey through this learning with my patients about how to do it, and I've been doing it for over 15 years. So uh, traditionally, we used to use flaps and grafts to try and open this up a little bit with mixed success. We've even done microvascular tissue transfer. That's where we take tissue from somewhere else in the body and transfer it up, again, with limited success. Um, but we actually have now developed another technique, which is in, in addition to this, which is lipotransfer. And this is taking fat from somewhere else in the body to restore volume in the orofacial of the whole face. Um, if, we, if the patient is done under a general anesthetic as a day case, in and out in the same day, the, uh, the procedure itself only takes about an hour. Uh, in certain patients with significant lung problems, obviously you can't have a general anesthetic, we can do it under block. There's not many of those, but we do those as well. We take fat from the ab abdomen and inject it in the periola region, but also the cheeks, nose, exactly wherever it's needed. There's no incisions, it's done through with needles. Um, the only incision they have is in the belly button, that's one stitch which is a double stitch and that goes away. So you have some bruising around the abdomen and the face, but really not much else. We have really minimal complications. It's a, it's a very low risk procedure from the surgical point of view. Uh, this is the, uh, how we take the fat from the abdomen. I take it from the fat through a little incision, either in the top or the bottom of the belly button with this small needle. It's centrifuged down, that's fat there, centrifuged. And so you, it starts off looking like that, and it ends up looking like that. And that's sort of free fat on the top and little blood on the bottom. We use the bit in the middle. Um, interestingly, I only use actually that part of the, uh, the fat. And that's based around work done maybe 12 years ago, which showed there was more fat stem cells in this part than that part. 
So this is actually enriched with fat stem cells, your own. So when patients come to me say, take a little bit more, I say to them, no, hang on to it, it's good stuff. <laughs> Keep growing. So we transfer it from this big syringe into these small syringes, and this is then injected with this little needle, which is injected inside your mouth, you don't really see it. Um, and it's laid out in layers. It's really important that it's laid out in these layers because the blood supply has to come back from where it's laid into, so this, this fat is kept alive. Um, this is a study which we did um, over the last four or five years, sorry, where we took uh, 62 patients with both diffuse and limited uh, um, systemic sclerosis on and off immunosuppression. I used to, when I first started, I was worried that immunosuppression would in somehow impair the chances of it working, um, but it became so pro problematic for the patients to stop immunosuppression that actually I said, look, let's try it without, do, without charging, stopping any of your medications whatsoever. So we actually stopped, about 10 years ago, we stopped them stopping their medication. So we treat them whether they are or are not on immunosuppression. And interesting, in the results from this study, we showed there's no difference in the outcome. We looked at it from a whole range of points of view, from mouth function, there's this sort of mouth function scale, against quality of life and volumetric changes. Uh, what we found is that the number of patients on immunosuppression and non-immunosuppression were equal. The median AIN range was sort of same, sex were mainly female patients, um, and again, similar numbers, both, both uh, limited and diffuse. Sorry, let's get that to work. What we found was, interestingly, in measuring mouth function, we found a significant improvement um, in mouth function, not only in the first treatment, where you get treated once, but if we subsequently treat you again, that actually improves again and again and again each time we treat you. But when we break down the subsets of mouth function, we found that interestingly, there's a, in a percentage of patients, also the sal sal saliva improved as well. The, the dryness of the mouth disappeared. Again, we don't know why, but we, we've demonstrated that as well. Again, unusual, we didn't expect that to find that. Uh, also, we found significant improvement at all quality of life measures. So it's made a significant difference to the patients that were treated. Um, from my point of view as a plastic surgeon, was really interested to look at, I used three-dimensional camera before and after surgery to work out the volumes. So treating nose, cheeks, chin, nasolabial folds, upper lip and lower lip. What I found is in cheeks, a significant percentage of fat remained after injection. You lose a little bit more around the upper and lower lip, but even when you lose your fat, you, you maintain roughly around 50% or so, you still get an antifibrotic effect. It still reverses the fibrosis. Sorry, I get this to move. Um, and this is an example of volumetric camera before and after, and you can see the shaded bits show where the volumes have changed, um, and you can see that around the lip. If you look at it from a photograph before, this is before, you can see fissuring up and down. The fissuring is much less than before, but you also, if you see the side profile of the lip, that's everted, so it's just after one treatment, it's improved the lip profile, and you can build on it each time. Example of a bit more advanced, again, lots of fissuring, perioral, again, improved, again, the lip volume improved, sorry. More severe case, again, you can see the lip show is improved. So what we found was graft survival was better than expected, decrease in pain and comfort, significant improvements in oral function. So articulation, speech was much better. Um, also, we've got dental work was easier. So they found that to get access to posterior dental work was easier because the soft tissue to send. And that's really where most patients have a real problem is they can't find dentists that will be happy to take them on because they have limited oral access. This procedure actually improves that. And this is an example I showed you at the beginning. This is a patient well known to me for a long time. She came to me with her lips stuck like that because, and there was no sulcus. So underneath here, there was a very, very small little ridge. Um, an, um, another surgeon had tried to advance her chin, and it split her lip, and there was a little fissure, and it used to dribble out of that, so she had real problems. She couldn't move that lip upwards, so she had real problems with oral closure, and she had, as I explained before, all those facial changes we uh, talked about. Um, in her, I used every single thing I had in my uh, armamentarium, including the fat transfer. Um, including release of all the soft tissue in the mouth down to the nerves and an inlay of a large graft. Sorry. Also suspension with fascia from her thigh to lift her lips as well as fat transfer. 
This is her before surgery. This is her after surgery. You can see the lip has come up very well. We're still not quite there, but it's significant change. This is her the other side. And this is her showing lip seal when this is as far as she could go before. So how does it work? We don't really know. <laughs> well, <laughs> the SRUK have been very helpful in trying to fund some of the work, but I don't know how it works. It might be just a, um, a mechanical effect, the fat going in there, but we don't think so. We think there's a, um, because I've used in other fibrotic conditions and have found similar antifibrotic effects. Uh, we think it might be related to the fat stem cell. Whoops. And as I explained before, this work we show where we only use this part, we have a higher um, concentration of fat stem cells in the fat graph, the part of the fat graph we use for patients. We think it's the fat stem cell, which is, again, why I say to patients, hang on to your fat, don't get rid of it. It's got really interesting stuff in there. Um, we've looked at from the function. We found that there's a difference between scleroderma and normal fat stem cells that behave slightly differently. But what we also looked at is when we put these, and this is work with David Abrahams, we put um, fat stem cells from scleroderma patients with fibroblasts. Uh, from scleroderma patients, we found a down-regulation in fibrotic genes. Again, it's turning off or switching off the genes. So we think this may be where it leads to. We think it might be related to that. We're not sure. We're trying to isolate it. We're trying to work it out. But say it is this, we could potentially isolate that, and that could be given as an intravenous therapy for all other organ systems to reverse fibrosis. And what we're up to now is we've got an NIHR-sponsored uh, trial uh, to look at a randomized trial to look at fat transfer in scleroderma patients either with treatment or without treatment. Uh, we're going to start recruiting in January for this study. Um, SRUK have been very generous because they helped us get the NIHR uh, grant because they gave us a grant in advance. And so we went to the NIHR and we said we have already got some money from the SRUK, so I thank you very much for that. Uh, and we're Oops, sorry, Lynn's introduced. Uh, we, we're trying to understand how it works. Um, and it's been carried out, obviously, at the Royal Freeze uh, with Chris Denton's team as well. And I'll lead on to Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Right, I normally have notes, so this time I'm doing it with no notes. Okay. Hi, I'm Lynn Stableski, and um, right, Peter, <laughs> help. Can you want to pass the slide? Yeah. Okay. Imagine. Imagine you've been sat down and diagnosed with an incurable disease, rare disease you've never even heard of. Your prognosis is probably going to be about five years. And if that's not bad enough, you, a few days later, you're admitted to a ward for your treatment for the first time, and you meet other scleroderma patients whose fingers have fallen off due to gangrene, whose facial changes are very unusual, and a patient had just passed away. This is what happened to me. Right, sorry, just got to get used to. That is the next slide. Go on again. Okay. All right, if you just want to do the slides then, yeah. Just move it along and I'll go with you. Okay. Do you want to go to the next one? So where do I go to the next one? Which one? The one on top. Okay, this happened to me 18 years ago. I was living in London at the time, and in fact, I was living in those apartments. My partner at the time and myself were living in one of the top apartments at the top. Um, I was there when they built the Millennium Wheel, which is now called the London Eye, and life was good. And that was me. Um, if you, I was doing part-time modeling, and if you take a look at the picture on the right-hand side, you can see straight, healthy, normal hands. I had a great career as well. I was an top entrepreneur businesswoman, and it was going very well. And then, the diagnosis. 
Lynn, you have an incurable rare disease called scleroderma. It was literally like that, like a bombshell going off, like an atomic bomb. Um, and those of you who have been diagnosed with it know exactly how, what the feeling is like. I was lost. Who do I turn to? Where do I go? I was beginning to lose myself. I lost my partner at the time. I lost my home. And I lost my job. I moved out of London and that was me. My facial changes started changing. And that to me at the time was quite, um, quite traumatic. It started to become disfigured. I began to not even recognize myself anymore. Where had Lynn gone? My lips started to shrink um, so much so I wasn't left with many lips. lips. My mouth was very tight, very painful. Um, as you can see, there's wires sticking out. I'd go along to the dentist, and she just really couldn't get to the back. And in the end, she says, it looks like we're going to have to take all your teeth out. So I said, heck no, that's the last thing I need. <coughs> Eating became a huge challenge. I do love my food, so pretty much down, I was down to soft foods, because chewing was just, well, getting it into the mouth, and... Um, was just pretty painful. And speaking. I loved to speak, but um, that pretty much put an end to that. So, um, and the reason was because it was pretty painful to talk and, you know, sort of couldn't even speak clearly. So everybody was, pardon, pardon, pardon. So um, life was pretty rotten, I have to say. And I ended up isolating myself. And I actually came to feel a misfit. As I said, I'd lost my friends and... Um, I just felt like I just didn't fit into society anymore. And then through Professor Chris Denton, I was introduced to Professor Peter Butler, and um, he was doing at the time these exciting stem cell treatments, which to me was hope, and hope is a wonderful thing. So um, I was one of the first patients, and I went along, and like um, Professor Butler was explaining, it was a case of going under a general anaesthetic, taking the fat from the belly, which is great. I thought, yay, get rid of some of that. But, and so my journey began. I had to, obviously, it wasn't immediate, but after a few sessions, I began to feel a bit like Lynn again. Um, over a couple of years and having a few, probably a couple of treatments, I was enabled to go out to society and eat, because eating isn't just about eating, it's about being social and... Um, I was beginning to feel part of a tribe, because we all like to belong. We all like to belong to a tribe. And I could eat steaks, because I love a steak. I'm originally from South Africa, and we love barbecues or bribes. And um, that was great. And the mouth, and fantastic. Now, my dentist had a smile on her face when she saw me. And um, I still got my teeth, and they're all mine. And she can get to the back of the mouth. And speaking, wow, OK. <laughs> much to my husband. He says I talk too much, and I probably do, but um, yeah, um, so much so Professor Butler actually invited me to speak at Downing Street when he was talking about stem cells. And you have to have confidence to do that, and I have to say it, um, I'd got my confidence back. And look, I'm in front of you guys talking, and without confidence you can't do that. Um, so, Thank you to Peter Butler for, um, for the stem cell group. So I believed so much in it that I, um, I was asked to, through Professor Denton and Professor Butler, to start up a focus group, which I now run. There's 200 patients, scleroderma patients, so um, I have cards to give it out. Anybody wants to join, and it's a focus group on Facebook, and we did... Um, just trials and support and finding out which really is the most troubling with, um, with your mouth. And a lot of it is the way we look. Okay. So much so, I started going back to writing classes and I wrote a book. I wrote a novel called Prize Winner, which is about love and passion and danger based in South Africa. It's not nothing to do about with scleroderma, but it's... Um, it's based on my life experiences while I was living before scleroderma. This was the book launch, which was at the Royal Free Hospital. Can you recognize any of those people there? 
who are now in the room. Um, <laughs> Simon Callow is not here, unfortunately, but he's the patron of the Charles Walton Centre. Um, lots of lovely patients. Professor Denton, Professor Butler, Sue Farrington and Amy, and Dr. Ong, and my husband. Through all of the stem cells, I met my lovely supportive husband, Carol, and donate. I was donating proceeds from my uh, book prize winner to uh, Scleroderma Research. So, Sue. So, guys, go and buy the book because it's going to a good cause. It's all going for Scleroderma Research, SRUK. And finally, and finally, okay, stem cells to me, I believe, are definitely the way forward. And my book is in the room over there. Um, come and buy a copy. Thank you.